Okay, well, thank you guys for joining our session. Um, we uh, will get started right away. Um, the nice thing is that Nico's already shown us a couple of the, uh, the tech tools that I'll be running through um, in our uh, Zoom portion of our session. So that's kind of great. Um, uh, what we essentially wanted to do in the session today um, is, is really highlight some of the technology or things that you can use in our very new forced on digital world. Um, to try to make things as interactive, interesting um, as possible. So you heard a little bit about who we are. Um, I'm uh, Farin Zavere. I'm at the University of Calgary. And I'm Brad Barth at the University of Kansas. And I'm Jim Miner from the University of Minnesota. <laughs> we needed to clarify who the Canadian was here before we got things on the <laughs> needed to. I just needed everyone in the audience to know, so. I, I don't mind Minnesota, but but I definitely am still from Calgary. <laughs> okay, so essentially what we want to do today, um, like I mentioned, is we want to go through some of the you know ways in which you can use digital tools to make your, whether it's your presentations, uh, whether it's projects you're collaborating on, essentially using these digital tools to make things as engaging and productive as possible. So we all work with a lot of different people on multiple, um, on multiple different projects, on publications, presentations. And if you're not working on any of those things in sort of a joint capacity, all of us, whether we want to or not, are part of meetings. Um, and so these next few slides are going to show how in these specific areas we can use some of the technology uh, to work with others seamlessly. So when um, I'm working on a collaborative project or a manuscript, um, and a lot of this is borrowed from uh, Teresa Chan, so I'm sure she won't be surprised to see sort of her excellent uh, methodology be uh, highlighted here. Um, but when we're when, when you first start with your you know your group or your project, that first meeting really is that uh, collaborative sort of brainstorming session, getting your whole team on board together. Um, so typically what we do is we start with a shared Google document. So you will need a, a Gmail account and then you can set up your drive. Um, what you see here um, is on that left upper hand side, you can see that new button at the top there. Um, so you know to get a, a document uh, started, you're gonna click that there. So if you've hit that new button, the next slide that you'll see is what comes up on your screen when you're trying to create a new document. So here, if you have previous documents that you want to upload, so if it's you know various manuscripts that you think the group needs to look through, all of those kinds of things, you can upload either a file or a folder from your own computers. Um, if you decide to share a folder between all of you, then all of you have access to all of the different, do different documents that are in here. And then you've got your Google Docs, which is essentially a Word document that you're sharing, your Google Sheets, which is an Excel document that you can share, um, and then your slides, which is a PowerPoint um, format that you can use there. So what you want to do is once you've actually created your Google Doc, um, and we can move on to the next slide there, um, there's a share button in the top right hand corner of this document. And the idea here is this is the screen that comes up once you hit that share button. And you can either add people individually. So let's say you only have two or three people who you're collaborating with. Um, you can add their email addresses right in that add people or group uh, address section there. Or if it's a very large group, um, you can actually copy or get a link and it will create a URL. So what I typically do is when I'm starting that new meeting or collaborating, um, I will uh, send an email out to the entire group with the Zoom link for that first meeting, as well as a document that I've started that has either an agenda um, or something to sort of get things going. Um, and I'll share that uh, URL in the email that I'm sending out to that group. Prior to the meeting that I'm leading, um, I'll put together an agenda, um, as I mentioned, and then um, I actually will share my screen during the meeting um, for that first collaborative uh, session or even for a meeting itself. Um, and then I'll add to that document or have someone else in the meeting add to that document if I'm leading it and it's too much to be sort of adding to your meeting minutes. Um, but the idea is that you're doing this all real time. And so the, the benefit of this is that you have the option of different people adding, you know, their comments into the documents or things like that, but it puts everyone on the same page in a shared document that down the road you can actually add people into so that they can see what's already been done. 
In the document itself, you can also tag different people for tasks that you may want to assign them, especially if they weren't able to participate in the meeting. Um, so that's sort of how I use uh, Google Documents for either that initial um, that initial uh, session, um, and then and then now what I'm going to kind of highlight with this Dropbox section is how I work on a collaborative project or a manuscript. So that first Google document that you set up is really for that first meeting um, for your manuscript uh, working group. And then what we essentially do is um, when we are at a stage where we're actually starting to write the manuscript, this is where you don't want 10 or 15 different people making multiple different edits, deleting other people's work, and you want to have a bit more control of your documents. This is where I find that Dropbox actually makes a big difference. So essentially what we do is, again, build an entire folder that you're going to then share with all of the people that are working on your project. So as you can see here, this is my master's thesis folder, and I've shared this folder with all of the committee members on my thesis. And then what, we, what I do is I have, if you see in this specific folder, there's an old chapter version. So those are all of the old versions of any of the papers or any of the, the chapters that I'm writing because you know, sometimes you wanna refer back to a different version, but essentially you don't wanna lose any of the documents that you've had previously. Um, so, and then the document you see right below that is the third chapter of my method section. So what I typically do is I'll email my entire thesis committee when I've uploaded a new document and I'll say, I have a new document. I'd love for you guys to take a look at this. And then I'd like you to comply with the following editing rules. And so, um, track to say, well, which one is the newest version? This is a really easy, simple way to sort of keep that up to date. Um, and this is just an example of the folder that I have that has a bunch of old drafts in it. And you can sort of see it's easy to figure out, okay, this is the date or the version that I want to go back to. So now we're going to move on to Slack, um, which is a really excellent online uh, communication tool. Um, a ton of companies and a, and a lot of different um, uh, groups use this uh, to essentially manage their communication. It removes a ton of email traffic from your inbox. Um, so this next slide here is an example of one of our online communities. So this is a, a community of over 200 emergency medicine chief residents on this shared Slack account. Um, so on this left panel, what you can see are all the different channels that are um, uh, that you're able to join. Some of them have lock boxes associated with them, so you can actually choose to invite specific people um, and keep the channel private, or you can have open channels that anyone who has access to this Slack account can join. This here is an example in the actual conference section. Um, there's a chief resident who had sent a message in, the, in this section that essentially asked, you know, we're trying to build this ortho simulation curriculum. Does anyone at any of the other programs have something that they've either already put together or some ideas or suggestions or lessons learned? And then the people who have been commenting sort of below it are all giving suggestions or you can upload specific documents. And the idea is, this, this chief resident doesn't have to reinvent the wheel, doesn't have to um, sort of build from scratch um, and can build off of other things that other people have shared in this, um, in this uh, channel. 
This next Slack account is actually one of our upcoming conferences in June um, in emergency medicine. So this is the planning committee that is on, um, on this Slack uh, conference planning channel. Um, so on the left side, there's a bunch of channels. There are obviously not as many channels as we needed to have for a chief resident uh, uh, Slack uh, group. And the idea and what we sort of use this for is you can see that there's a lot of documents that are being uploaded and shared. Uh, we'll share Zoom links on here. Uh, you can directly message people. And essentially, we've planned the entire conference on this platform, not using email at all. Now, this, of course, especially since we're on this platform, is quite familiar to everyone. Um, so I just wanted to highlight just a few of the things that because Zoom is the most frequently used virtual online platform, just a couple of things that makes it a bit more interactive. I won't spend too much time here as Nico sort of already uh, demonstrated a few of the things I'm gonna talk about. So we'll move on to the next slide there. Um, so, you know, a lot of meetings, you're gonna have people's screens are off, their, you know, their audio is gonna be off and you're really trying to push people to interact especially in our conferences or a lot of our, our Zoom sessions and meetings, uh, we'll have staff that are on their bike or they're washing dishes or they're doing a lot of other things and you really want them to be able to answer questions. Um, so the chat function is really useful. You can, especially as a host, you can actually turn off uh, any of the identifiers so you can ask some very kind of challenging questions that maybe even in an actual in-person meeting, people wouldn't want to uh, comment or sort of say anything because they feel uncomfortable. So you can allow them to anonymously comment. But I find that the chat function, a lot of times when people don't want to turn their audio off or it's very clunky, you've got a lot of people in the group, um, you can throw questions up into the chat function and sort of use that. And then the next one um, that I wanted to show is this reaction. We use this a lot in our competency committee meetings when we're doing a lot of voting on sort of how people in the group feel. Um, or if you've got a meeting where you've got a lot of people who, who kind of talk over each other, I'll use that raise hand function um, so that you, if you're facilitating the meeting, can call on someone so that they know who is sort of next in line to speak, especially on, on some of the more contentious decisions that need to be made. So that's a great button to sort of use quite often. And then the last one I just wanted to show is being able to use direct polls within your Zoom here. So you can actually create your poll as Nico had before you even jumped into the presentation or into your Zoom um, and then just launch it when you actually want this to happen in the session. Um, I won't launch a new one here since we've already seen one occur um, earlier on in this session, but I will turn it over to Brad, who's going to talk about a few more interactive polls. For this section, we're going to talk about some, some of the interactive software. And so it's helpful if you have your phone handy or your smart device. And uh, one of the nicest things that's happened with the change to a more digital platform is the um, the almost the democratization of who gets to participate in our conversations. You know, it, when you're in a big classroom, I find that there's three or four students that'll answer all the questions. And so that means there's 75 people that I don't hear from. They're there, but I don't know what they're thinking. Um, by using some of this interactive software, it really gives us the chance to hear from a broader spectrum of, of students. It also helps, or participants, it also helps to, um, to get everybody that, that's kind of the chance to participate and uh, so I can, can hear from, from more people. And Zoom has some built-in features, but we're gonna talk about some other ones here. So Poll Everywhere is uh, certainly a very common one. Uh, there's a free version that you can have 25 students uh, in each session. A lot of institutions have institutional versions, which, which increases the number of uh, participants in your polls. The one clunky thing is, is that we're doing so much on Zoom that uh, currently you have to use the web as your, as your presentation platform rather than the built-in integration with PowerPoint or Keynote. Poll Everywhere will work integrated into PowerPoint if you're doing a live presentation. Something about going over the Zoom doesn't work, although I think they may have fixed that for um, PCs. Poll Everywhere is really pretty smooth and easy. Um, it's easy to reply. You can reply um, via text or via the, uh, uh, the, the app that can be on your phone. And there are many, many question types, which is really kind of a nice thing to, uh, to be able to play with. So when you get to Poll Everywhere, 
you'll log in on that last page. You can either click a new activity or a new group, and that will start up some new questions. So I've created this group for the Mac faculty development. Uh, you can see what the questions look like. We'll pop over to the poll everywhere. And so here we're in the poll everywhere app. We can activate a question. So this question is active. And when I click into that, you get to the presenter view and you're able to see some some options as to what how to respond. The other thing that we'll do then if we're presenting is click the full screen and then it pops up to the big view that, uh, that your students will see. And we should be able to either using your native app or uh, using the, uh, Kenya, there, there's a question from Kenya, maybe I'm sorry, I'm probably saying that name wrong, of Mentimeter. You know, we discussed it yesterday and I, uh, Took it out. It's a, a great program. I think it's based out of Australia or started in Australia, but it has um, lots of uh, a lot of good questions that you can 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 use. But time was the reason. So with this, people can keep responding. And as you see, the word cloud pops up and. This is one of the nice ways of, of uh, using poll everywhere. One of my favorites for getting a temperature of the room. We'll go back to PowerPoint. So Kahoot is one of the other apps that's pretty commonly used. Um, it's a nice way of, uh, of gamifying things, of making it a little more uh, a little more fun. It is uh, the free version. Uh, if you sign up as an educator, it gives you the opportunity to have 100 players, um, which is a pretty good amount. Um, you can buy uh, more and more features, uh, and it's not terribly expensive between 36 and $100 a year US, um, but, it, but it works pretty well. So you can create questions and keep them handy. And we'll pop over to the Kahoot and open it up and we'll play. There's a little clicking you have to get through to get there. So with this, you'll need to, on your Kahoot app, enter the game pin, which is 139-5380. All right, so we'll get started here. It does have... Um, different soundtracks you can choose to hear, which is nice. And these are timed. You can see that this one is counting down to... And the nice thing about gamifying things is it just makes it a little bit more interesting, a little bit fun. And so we uh, will see the distribution and then it awards points. And, and so you get to be the champion for the day. So that's kind of fun. All right, so that is Kahoot. It's a nice, a nice one. Uh, the other one that we're gonna talk briefly about is Slido. It is uh, similar to Poll Everywhere. It has limited free capacity. Um, but again, if you're not tied to pull everywhere with your institution, you might want to check it out. Um, it is also has that same problem of not being able to integrate with PowerPoint while you're using Zoom. So on Zoom, you need to go to the web again, like we're doing, which as you can see, adds a little bit of clunkiness to it. So this is what I see is, have you used Slido? The, the questions that I wrote, we can go into the present mode. So this is the, the polling questions. I, I like this feature here of um, being able to, uh, to rank features in a, in a e pretty easily selectable way. So we'll come back to see any answers in here. 
a little bit later. So then the other th two options uh, that you saw a little bit of it with Fareen and the uh, Google Forms, that also lives within the Google Docs environment. Um, but then Microsoft also has a similar feature of Microsoft Forms. And if your institution um, has the connection there, uh, then you can do that. It's uh, very similar to the Google Forms. It's included for most people with Microsoft Office. Uh, you can use this QR code to get to the survey uh, or the link that I put in the chat. And I'll show you what it looks like from, from my end. This is what you'll see when you click through. Um, it does have some question options that are handy for us. And then when, as the votes come in, this is the, the response that I'll see or that you'll see on the backside. So again, it gives you some stats and some easy ways to, to manage it. So here we're having more, more responses come in. So interesting. All right, and so that is the, the quick and dirty on some of those uh, ways of interacting and pulling more in that interaction from your audience and involvement. So I'm gonna turn it over to, to Jim now. I wanna talk about a few other things uh, that have come up really in the last year. So in my department at Hennepin County Medical Center, which is in University of Minnesota, we view Slack pretty much all for all of our internal communications and document sharing for five years. But we got to COVID, we ran into a whole new problem. We were no longer meeting in person. And we needed to reproduce a lot of what was going on in those meetings. We found very quickly that in two to three people meeting, Zoom met our needs. But once we got larger than that, we were losing a lot of the richness of the meeting. Overlapping voices, people not being completely centered in their conversation because they're at home, the kids and pets and everything else going on. And I'm gonna just, just throw a few of the successes we've had in the show. I'll stay off the stuff that didn't work because there's plenty of things like everything that didn't work so great. First, I want to talk about is Jamboard. Jamboard's a, a free thing you can find on Google. It's really expensive if you actually buy a Jamboard, which is a big TV that you, know, you can write on and stuff and, and function in the software. But essentially, it's just, a, um, it's just a canvas that you can put other apps on. Now, we've tended to use it overlapping with Zoom. So we run Zoom and we run Jamboard at the same time for discussions. In this picture here, one of our docs, Brian Driver Selection, is giving a presentation to our residents. He's got one spot that's his face brought over, uh, giving the presentation, and another one where he's got a PowerPoint. Um, this is running at the same time as he's on Zoom. What it ends up doing is he's giving a recorded lecture, and then they're talking in the background. Now, in Minnesota, we used to have this TV show called Mystery Science Theater 3000. It's gone now, so I date myself. But... Essentially what that was, they'd watch old movies and the people in the background would talk about the movie. And it kind of feels like that. So you're watching a presentation, but you can have a discussion about the presentation at the same time by overlapping, by being on Jamboard while you're running Zoom together. And it actually works really well for small presentations when you want to have a semi-informal discussion as you would if you were together watching something together or going through some data together. The other way, I'm just going to quick jump over to Jamboard. Here's just one that was left over from a presentation I was doing to residents last week on how to use tissue perfusion monitoring. Essentially, it's just a discussion place where you just send out, you just grab a link. If you just hit the share, it gives you a link that you can put in the chat on your Zoom conversation. It brings you to the Jamboard. It's really nice for discussing figures. In particular, they have a function here. This is the laser pointer. And once you put that on, it gives you a little laser pointer on the screen, which is delayed because of our connection speed. But it gives you the ability to mark where you're talking on the screen in a little bit more effective way than you can do with, uh, with just a pointer when you're meeting. Um, and leaving other marks on the screen is you know, fairly easy if you wanna write something or, it really works well for figures mostly is where I've used it the most. And that's been fairly effective and it's free and it's easy. So that's been really nice. Now, the one place we've really had a ton of luck in our meetings is with Padlet, which is another uh, piece of software. It's a free version of it. We, we have the paid version and it has a lot more graphics and stuff, but the free one is fine for most purposes and I'm gonna discuss. There's a bunch of different 
uh, modes it's in. It's in a wall, grid, and shelf one, which essentially makes a poster. So if you're making a poster presentation, Padlet kind of gets you there. But then it has a stream and a back channel version, which essentially just give conversation. The stream one puts the most recent comment at the top, and the back channel one puts the oldest comment at the top. I'll show you these in just a sec. Here's the back channel. So what back channel is really useful for, this is from the start of a meeting with my soccer team that I coach, uh, but it works, what it does is it records a meeting. And when we use this in our meetings, essentially it's when we need to generate a product of the meeting that's more substantial uh, than just a recording of our discussion. So what we do is anytime anyone wants an aspect of that meeting, I, I send an invite out, which is, I'll show you, you can either, you can either do a link or just a, just a QR code. Again, save it, you export it out of Padlet into an image, and now I have a recording of the meeting uh, that we all agreed to at the time. It's, it seems to go much more effectively and interactively than somebody typing out minutes in a Google Doc, which is how we started and just felt bland to all of us. Um, timeline is the one we didn't expect, we found by accident, and has been the most the biggest step forward, we're not even meeting in person, we'll probably stay with meeting with Google, with a Padlet timeline. What this is, what we've been using it for is QA review of an individual case. What you end up with is a little timeline, you can see here, and anyone can point at any time along this timeline, click it and add something in there. So I just, I started an artificial case just to give you an example how it looks. So when you're trying to dissect a case in a group discussion, we found this went really well in person. It was really hard to do by Zoom because we'd lose track of what we were talking about. And it was really hard to come up with a great way to walk through the case where we could all see what we were doing. So we marched through the case and people would say, well, no, this is where this happened. This is where that happened. We all have different versions of the medical history and what we're trying to remember. And we have found this to be an incredibly effective way to not only record our discussion of a case when we're looking for a, usually a root cause analysis of an error, um, but also for teaching purposes as we're going back and working through a case as we present it, we're using Timeline more and more. I first noticed Timeline because my kid's uh, history teacher was using it, which is I think what it was designed for. Uh, the fact that it's so useful for QA discussions in medicine, I think is a new potential for it. And then maybe Padlet will figure that out and modify it specifically for medicine, because obviously the draft background isn't exactly what you want in a QA document. You can change it to something else. I, I kind of like that one, but it, it looks a little less formal when you're entering your QA review. Usually by the time we're done, it just, it goes line after line. So it starts a new line down here afterwards, but it's, I recommend giving it a try on a discussion on a QA case, because it really works well um, to the point where we're, no matter, even when we're meeting back in person again, we'll probably use that as our main QA facilitator. Um, streaming uh, is what, well, what streaming is really nice for is it brings the, uh, it's, it records what essentially would just be in your chat box on Zoom. Now, where we've started using this is in our faculty meetings with more than five or six people, we've, with everyone remote, we found that discussions would break down. Um, I think a lot of people found this, right? Because one person would be talking, they wouldn't know someone else was talking because of the connection delays and stuff like that. And we had a hard time having large group discussions on complex issues, you know, how we're going to change the way we use a drug as a group or how we're gonna change the monitoring or what we wanna do about a certain kind of change in our medical practice. So we started using Padlet streaming and we'd all go to that and it just nice organized, puts everybody's comments in a row. We can see what questions we haven't gotten to. I can go back and click on something that we have gotten to. I can mark a mark on something that we missed because we moved the discussion went another way. So we, and everyone sees it, everyone knows where it's at. And if you want, you can keep it at the end, especially if you come to a decision and it was a productive discussion. Um, one of the things we got spoiled by with Slack is all of our arguments and discussions get saved in Slack permanently, which we found very useful because a year later, two years later, we can go back and say, what did last time we argued about this? Where did we get to? We can go back and look at it. Um, and we kind of find the same thing with Padlet. It just gives us a recording of something that otherwise we would have lost. 
again, this is an enhancement. So we've, we've kind of fallen onto this because we're forced to do everything remotely. But now we're finding that this is really how a really, I tend to use back channel more because it's in order. So someone comes back a year later, it doesn't go backwards. Streaming, the Padlet streaming is more effective for real time use. Back channel is more effective for saving it, uh, for, for making a recording of what went on. Finally, there's, there's just Padlet can Canvas. And with a Padlet Canvas sitting right here, um, what we tend to use this for is when multiple people are collaborating on a presentation. So in this one here, I just kind of threw some examples up. Here's my PowerPoint. Quick, this is the QR. You can get a QR code on any Padlet. And that's how I invite everyone to it. So I just grab the QR code. It, it, uh, it exports from Padlet as an image to me. And I just post the image in the chat box and everybody can jump to the Padlet really fast. It's really smooth, very, very easy. My most untech savvy colleagues can jump right in after you know maybe one or two times of walking them through it. But when you get in the um, the canvas, you can keep your PowerPoint up there, bring it up when you're ready to talk about it, pop out when you're done, and um, other people can post other things they want as you go, and you can move around on multiple multiple presenters very easily, but stay at one screen. And again, we'd run this in parallel to Zoom, so we'd be on Zoom with one of the presenters sharing uh, the Padlet, but everyone in the meeting is at the Padlet. And then they can also post comments at any point. Uh, actually, I forgot. So then their comments up there. Someone puts a comment up. It's right in the middle. Uh, you can move it out of the way later when it's done. Works very well, and it's um, it keeps people in, interactive because they they don't walk away and do the dishes during your presentation if there's a Padlet running and they 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 feel like things are going to show up and people can put up images and whatever you really need to put in there. Um, and it's pretty user friendly. So one of the you know most, a lot of people have very different levels of skill and comfort uh, with electronic communications. And I think one of the things I've really seen in the last year is that's gotten easier. There's it takes less skill than it used to. You can just double click on the screen and it asks you what you want to do, and it's kind of made made much more simple. So it's easier to work with. So Prezi's not new. A lot of you guys, Prezi came out six, seven years ago. It was a lot of fun. And we found that we made people vomit in the audience because they got motion sickness. Um, so I would kind of walked away from it, as fun as it was. I think it has a little bit of a new life in, uh, in an online presentation. I've found that unlike previous, now that I'm using Prezi, when people are engaged online, I think they follow me a little bit more than these. So here's a lecture I was giving to our faculty a couple of weeks ago. And this kind of motion, which made people sick when they were sitting in a room looking at a big screen, is actually more engaging. And because I can move around, it feels more like a discussion than it did. I think a lot of what Prezi hoped to do when it first came out worked a lot better in online communication and virtual meetings than, in, than it did in person. And so I've actually restarted using Prezi after leaving my account dead for about five years. Um, and I'm finding that it's got, a, it's got a life of its own that's back. And um, people are engaged with the lectures when I use it. And that was fun and exciting because I thought it was cool when it came out. It's much easier to make the presentations in PowerPoint, Keynote, some of the more standard presentation formats we're all used to. It's worked well. And I usually just embed it in a Jamboard, actually. Uh, so I can pop out when something else comes in because it is hard to to fix it on the fly while you're talking. That is one of the downsides of it. So one of the things to think about uh, as you're putting together these presentations or using these tools is what's the purpose for what you're doing? Um, so just because we have all these cool tools um, doesn't mean that they fit or that you should be using them all the time. And so really trying to be mindful about what is the value that this tool is bringing to our session, I think is important. So if your meeting is primarily informational, then maybe the, the Prezi works to help sh uh, share information and keep people involved, or maybe you need to use a different platform altogether. You know, Maybe that's the time when just a, a podcast or an email would work better. Educational, depending on what kind of interaction you're looking for, those are some things to keep in mind. Um, Decision-making, you know, the poll software and, and the, uh, the software that Padlet and stuff that Jim talked about is really helpful for decision-making. 
team building, Kahoot is a kind of a nice tool for that. But being mindful of when to choose, I think, is something to keep in mind. You know, as we summarize all the all the different tools, the the fundamental thing to take is, I mean, what's nice for us to see sort of in our Canadian context is our American colleagues have already started to go back to in-person meetings. You're seeing the transition start to happen back to the way things were. We're we're, we're anxiously hoping for that for that here in in Canada, but it but it's coming, and we know that it's coming. And the and the big thing to ask yourself is. You know, there's benefits to the virtual world, but there's also benefits to the in-person meetings and things like that. And so finding a balance between the two of those, depending on who you're meeting with, you know, is it a bunch of shift workers that cannot make their schedules work in person and you are going to continue a hybrid um, in terms of virtual versus, you know, in person? Um, are there specific tools? So Jim sort of mentioned some of the things that they're actually using in a physical meeting they're still using technology. So just because you're going back to an in-person session doesn't mean you abandon all of these tools and tricks that you guys have learned in the virtual world. It's understanding um, what works in sort of what context, depending on what you're trying to get in whichever meeting it is that you're in. Um, and, and, you know, you're going to have collaborations across, you know, whether it's the country, across North America, et cetera, in which case you can't use an in-person format and you do want it to be interactive and use some of these tools. And then the final thought that I sort of leave you with is a lot of this can be really overwhelming when you're seeing 20 different tools and, you know, a 30 minute presentation of all the different things that you can potentially use. At, at the end of the day, you need to sit down and, and open up, whether it's a Kahoot or whatever the case is, and practice. So if it's with you and, you know, someone at home and you're just sort of playing around with the tools so you get a bit more comfortable with it, and then you try it once in one of your presentations and you sort of see how the interaction works there, and you kind of go from there, um, you'll, you'll be much more comfortable with it and not finagle with all the little details when you've had a chance to try out multiple different versions. Thank you.